Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I am Carrie Friedberg, the SF Money Coach. I am a personal finance and small business money coach, financial behavior specialist, and financial literacy educator. I recently launched a DIY do-it-yourself personal finance 101 course with 25 mini lessons on the practical and emotional sides of money, as well as a financial literacy monthly membership site where you can learn, practice, connect, and receive support for an entire year. You can read all of the details at sfmoneycoach.com slash membership. And hooray, please join me in welcoming our guest today, Brad Plonts. Brad and I met in a virtual classroom. He was my professor at the Hyder School of Business at Creighton University. And he has also worked as a financial psychologist with my very own family of origin, as well as many of my clients. <laughs> Brad is a, an expert in financial psychology, financial planning, and applied behavioral finance. He's an associate professor of practice at Creighton. He's also the co-founder of the Financial Psychology Institute and managing principal of Mental Wealth Advisors. He's a six-time author on personal finance, and I highly recommend all of his books. He has received several awards for his application of psychological interventions to help people with money and wealth issues, and his innovative practice in financial psychology for practitioners across the country. Brad has been a columnist all over the world, including the Journal of Financial Planning, On Wall Street, Psychology Today. His work has also been featured on TV many times, ABC News, Good Morning America, as well as in print US USA Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Time Clippers, Kiplinger's, it goes on and on, uh, Money Magazine, NPR, and many other media outlets. He's really the bomb. He's partnered with organizations like Capital One, JP Morgan, Mutual of Omaha and h &R Block in all kinds of efforts to help raise public awareness around issues related to financial health and financial psychology. Just wow. I am lucky to call Brad my mentor, my friend and colleague. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. My mom wrote that bio. It was embarrassing, but <laughs> she says it must be read word for word. So thank you for indulging her. Okay, you're welcome. That's hysterical. Um, he's joined me today, today to talk about happiness and conscious spending. And if it's just a small audience today, but if questions come up and you want to drop them into the chat, please do or write them down. We'll reserve time at the end for Q&A. And please mute yourselves if you're listening for now. So Brad, to start things off, would you share with us a little bit about your background and family history with money? Sure. So I grew up lower income. My mom likes to say we were middle class except lower. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, they have words for that, you know. Um, but, but I think that sort of illustrated how she felt about our financial status. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, I've learned a lot about my own psychology around money by interviewing my mom, my poor mother, I should say, and my father. Um, in my training as a psychologist, I would go home quite often and pull out a tape recorder and interview them <laughs> around my psychology and all my hangups. And it was very uncomfortable for my mother um, quite often. But I, I found out that she, she grew up in, in inner city Detroit and went to a school that had Half the kids came from a really poor area where she came from. The other half came from a really rich area. Mm -hmm. And she just really wanted to be not associated with the poor area. She had a lot of shame around it. She would um, keep track of the outfits she wore. So she would never wear the same one. And she only had like five. And so she tried to um, various strategies to try to show the world that she had more money than she did um, out of shame. And so, um, and then my parents got divorced when I was two and regardless of if you're low income before that happens, you're even lower when after that happens. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, I was really curious as a kid, what, what is the difference between rich people and poor people, obviously on the money side, right. but because I saw in my family a bunch of hardworking, dependable, high integrity people and some branches of my family have been around since the Mayflower. 
And why are we living in a trailer park? You know, I mean, like, why don't we own a building? Why don't we own land? I, I think I got really curious about that because I didn't feel inferior on the side in terms of my family and on the side of hard work, gumption, you know, smarts, but I got really curious on the psychology. So um, I then later became a clinical psychologist yeah. and um, long story short, I had a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. I was desperate to get out of it. My mom did raise me to be frugal, like to never take on any debt. It was the only way I'd get through school though. And um, I was terrified and I saw a friend make a hundred thousand dollars trading in the stock market. Yeah. And I was like, ah, there you go. Um, he made it in one year. And so I sold my truck. I, I lived like a total pauper. I had lawn chairs for furniture. I had one fork. I drove a $500 car, got into day trading. Um, and I'm a multimillionaire. I'm actually not, that's not quite the trajectory. I ended up losing all my money and sitting back going, whoa, so why would a reasonably intelligent person do something so stupid with his money? And that question is what has led me to 20 years of research and study and self-development and, and trying to share that with others. Wow, such a great story. And I so appreciate your sense of humor. And go Tigers. Wait, were you born at St. John's? I was born in Farmington Hills. Okay, um, I was, I was yeah. born in Detroit at St. Oh, John's. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. I know, we've never talked about that another time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay. Well, we need to talk about that when we play tennis finally too. Like that's yeah, the only thing we've ever done together. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Double, double win. I can't wait. Um, would you share your earliest money memory with us? Um, I think that I, you know, I mean, this is something obviously that I, I talk a lot about, but I don't think a lot about for myself. And um, the one that comes to mind every time I probably have a different answer, but the one that comes to mind for me was when I was, when I was young, I, I don't know, old enough to remember this, so maybe four or something. And our TV broke. And um, we didn't have any money to repair the TV. And I, I remember my mom going up on the TV and putting her hand on it, like, like you're in a, um, you know, evangelical church, which, which I was raised in and, and praying to God to heal our TV. Yeah. And um, I remember it popping on. And, and so I, that, that's, oh, wow. <laughs> but the, but the mon money memory there, um, she might've kicked it on the side. I don't know. Maybe it was a, an intervention from God. Um, but I, I think the, the message there was like, we, we clearly don't have enough money. <laughs> If we need God to help us with this, but wow, right. that's so interesting. It, a distinct memory like that of a, of a spiritual experience or because it was like, is God going to help us right now? Um, and did she have a sense of humor as well? Or was this a very somber action? You've met my father um, yeah. who's, who does, isn't really the sense of humor person. So I, I, you, I get it from my mother. Yeah. I she's, okay. she's a sort of a vivacious laugh, lots of laughter in my family. Lots of uh, love. I, I see. Okay. And do you think that experience had a lasting impact? Um, I think it did on the, the side of, um, first of all, manifesting is, is pretty cool. Like I, I am big into that. I'm big into um, getting really clear about my goals, writing them down. Um, I, I remember that I, I, I did that obsessively for a while. And um, a few years ago, I, I looked back on this list of 100 goals and some of them were ridiculous. And I was actually shocked at how many of them that, that had manifested for me. I mean, it's sort of incredible. Wow. So I'm a huge fan of like having a vision, you know, and, and just getting super clear about it because I literally think that like subconsciously, I then started to be attracted to indicators in my life that this was possible and yeah. open-mindedness to opportunities that I might not, I might've been shut off from or not even paid attention to because I had never been clear on the goal. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two, I think it, for me too, it's like being poor sucks right? and um, it's not fun. And it's not something that anyone should have to endure. And being, being sort of stuck in that mindset is to me um, very, very damaging. And the belief that there, you can't do it or that it's unavailable to you. I mean, you know this, I create a lot of social media content yeah. targeting people in that demographic, which was me, because I didn't know the simple path to wealth. And I thought it was really complicated. I thought I had all these beliefs that you have to be born rich. Right. You know, it's an insider's game. It's not available to the average person. So I, I had a lot of those myths that I had to unwrap for myself over the years. Okay. Yeah. And that was, you did that not only in your graduate work in psychology and uh, becoming licensed as the clinical psychologist, but additional personal development work that you've done as a single person and with your wife. And um, it's just an ongoing <laughs> journey. 
so that we don't fall into the old patterns of behavior. Um, so something that you really defined and that I now, as your students, talk a lot to my clients about is money scripts. What is this phenomenon? Yeah, so money scripts is the term that um, I we've used. My father and I came up with that term. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that it's that much of an innovation, <laughs> but to describe these beliefs around money. So when I got into the whole field of psychology, believe it or not, and this is crazy. So I, I told you that I asked myself the question, why would a reasonably intelligent person do something so stupid with his money? Um, and I, I went into the field of psychology because literally I was like, okay, so I'm trained to do this as a student in, in clinical psychology. I'm going to go do a lit review is what we call it, mm -hmm. where you dive in there and you read all the studies that have been done in this topic area. You pull out the gems and then you use that to help a client or to help yourself. Right. So I, I did that and I couldn't find anything. And it was, I, I did this thing. I did, okay. Wrong search terms, you know, so I'm trying to find all these. I came up empty. And so that was a profound moment for me because I was like, okay, hold on a second. I, I don't really get this. So psychology has been around for hundred years, you know, um, formal psychology as a science, more than hundred years. And money is the biggest source of stress in the lives out of 80% of Americans. And um, who do you go see when you're stressed out? Isn't it a therapist? I mean, isn't that what you're supposed to do? But there's nothing around money. And um, I got really um, a little bit upset by that. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I'd be an expert in this area if, if all that research had been done. I don't know what I'd be doing. I would probably would have read the studies, read some books on my way. Right. Um, but I sort of joke that um, within a matter of a few weeks, I became the world's leading expert in financial psychology. <laughs> Real easy when your entire profession ignores something and you just pay attention to it for two weeks. That's how yeah. you get to that elite exactly. status. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah, so money scripts evolved out of that because um, there had been one study that was done that showed that your attitudes around money had nothing to do with your income, your net worth or anything. And I was like, mm, that is, there's something wrong with that research because every other study shows that, for example, your beliefs about um, your life and who's in control of your life have a profound impact on your mood. Mm -hmm. Your beliefs about um, your security in the world have, have a profound impact on your experience of anxiety. So your beliefs have a huge impact in every area of your life. Why not money? And so that's what led to us creating, um, you know, we, we gather as many money beliefs as we could from clients over the years. And then we ended up creating a scale related to it. Uh, so your beliefs around money predict your income, your net worth, your financial behaviors, your credit card debt, a whole host of things. Okay. So complicated question, perhaps, maybe, maybe not for you, but so people get aware, they maybe do your online survey, which is free and um, totally worthwhile um, at yourmentalhealthadvisors.com, right? Yeah, actually, uh, moneyscripts.com will get you there. Okay, much now easier. as well. Yep. Okay, much easier. Yeah, I made, I made an easier route to it. You know, okay, so. good. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> That's news to me. Awesome. Um, and then they get this awareness and they they get the reflection and the affirmation, probably what they already knew about themselves. Let's say um, they had a tendency or a stronger money script than others. Now what? What do they do with that information? How can, you know, especially if they have a history of self-destructive behaviors around money or something that limited beliefs um, that are just keeping them in a socioeconomic group where you know, they're stuck in the credit card cycle or they can't get out. How do they, how do people make lasting changes as an adult? Yeah. So what's, what's so fascinating about the discussion of money scripts, and I love that you're doing this in your course too, Carrie, um, money is such a taboo topic. So we don't have a lot of opportunities to think about our thinking about money. And um, I use this example all the time where um, as a teenager, or as uh, you know, we start to think about dating and we start to think about um, who we're attracted to and, and even already in the back of your mind, at least your biology is thinking about mate selection, right? <laughs> um, and, and we have a lot of conversations about it. So we talk with our, our friends about it in high school. You know, we, we go to our friend's house and we watch their parents interacting. The whole time we're going, mm, I don't like that. And, oh, I do like that. You know, I mean, we're getting all this information about who we are, what we want in a relationship, our beliefs around all that. We don't have that same opportunity with money. Nobody talks about money. You know, right. we, we see these clear indicators on money and status, um, but nobody talks about it. So what I found to be pretty profound is, you know, if you start to identify some of your beliefs around money, 
For example, one of the money categories, and I'm not sure if we have time to talk about it, but is money avoidance, where um, we found in our studies that a lot, some people believe rich people are greedy, money corrupts. Uh, you can't get rich unless you take advantage of other people. There's virtue in having less money. Um, interestingly, our studies show that psychologists and psychology are more vulnerable to that, which explains why we don't want to talk about money. <clears throat> you know, those beliefs will trip you up. Like it's a negative association with money. What's so fascinating about this is it always comes from some deep, deep truth. Like somebody, some rich person did something terrible to right. somebody, you know, or, or you directly. And so we don't arrive at these beliefs, you know, out of nowhere. Like yeah. there's a context in which that is hundred percent true. But what happens is we then can believe that to be the only truth screen out information showing uh, people like doing great things like eradicating polio or, you know, curing diseases or giving philanthropically and, and even put like a negative association on that. They're only doing it for a tax break or they're only, you know, they're only doing that to try to get people to like them. I mean, we, we have this filter that can keep us stuck. And, and what's so fascinating about that money belief, highly correlated with the belief that more money and more stuff's going to make me happier. So the big irony here is the people that most hate rich people are the ones that most desperately want to be rich themselves. <clears throat> and I've seen this play out and I'm sure you've seen it played out too, where people start to get some success. And then what happens is they, this, this bias pops out, this belief, uh, you know, oh no, I'm bad now. And right. they have family and friends to support that. So they start to feel like they're distancing themselves from their family and their family's looking at them in a, in a bad way. And then they subconsciously sabotage themselves and they're on this roller coaster back and forth. Just an example of, you know, two very competing beliefs that are, that are really strongly associated mm -hmm. that can just keep us in this bust and boom cycle and keep tripping us up. Yeah. And, and keep levels of stress and anxiety about money quite high. Yes. I, 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 I know, you know, we share a client who um, struggled her whole life, received us for her hugely significant um, inheritance. And is it, it's been a very short period of time and it's almost gone. It's this predictable um, pattern. And, and yeah, so tell me why people have, have um, such a hard time changing socioeconomic groups. Yes. Um, and so, you know, back to your other question too, like awareness can help. If you have a lot of strong emotion attached to that belief though, it gets tough. And that's where somebody with your expertise as a um, financial behavior specialist, somebody who has some expertise and understanding that help you unwrap the emotions related to it to, to sort of decrease that intensity. That's really important to like open your mind up to accepting other versions of reality. Cause that's essentially what we want to do. It's like, like rich people are greedy that's only part of the story, you know? So if you can even change that to some rich people are greedy, that changes everything Yeah. because you don't have to be one of those people. Yeah. Um, and, and what's sort of sad to me is the people are the most conscientious and the, the best people in the world. When they have that belief, what are you doing? You're just yielding all the money and power to these big bad people. Don't do that. Go get it, you know, become wealthy, do great things in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's a message that, um, and by the way, I'm talking to myself as I'm sharing this with you too, because I grew up in that scenario where, I didn't know any rich people and I had negative associations with those people mm -hmm. uh, because part of it is that helped us feel better about where we're at, you know? Yeah. Um, and so why is it so tough to shift socioeconomic groups? It is so incredibly tough. And I, I just tweeted this out the other day. I said, if you come into a large sum of money, you got two choices. Number one, get rid of all your money or right. number two, get rid of all your friends. <laughs> And it's like, whoa, yeah. you know, what are you saying there? And, and really what it comes down to is we have this tribal brain. So 99.9% .9 of our experience on earth as human beings has been in a small little tribe, 150 closely rated, related people, your status. I always think it's funny when people say, don't worry about what people think about you. It's like the people who didn't worry about what people thought about them all died off. Yeah. You know, um, th that's not how it works. We, we all care very deeply about what people think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it, what's funny is we'll even drift towards group who groups who pretend that they don't, but we're really concerned about that group. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's built into our DNA. But what happens is the further we get from our tribe, the more anxiety we feel, mm -hmm. the more pressure there is to come right back. Right. And, and I think that's really what it comes down to. It's like almost like a rubber band that pops you back because, um, it's much easier to become wealthy slowly because you can sort some of that out as you go. Yes. Uh, but when you come into it all at once, predictably, most people are going to blow it because all of a sudden you're different than your family and friends. Mm -hmm. People are going to start asking you for money. Yeah. You're not going to 
you're going to feel like you need to say yes. I mean, because that's the other thing that keeps lower income tribes together is we all share everything. You know, right. that's how we survive. Mm-hmm. And so hold on a second. Who are you? Who do you think you are? You know, like all of a sudden you're betraying everyone in your tribe to, to ascend. And that's kind of what happens. And you need to have a rationale for it. Why are you doing it? Can you help people more if you're able to do it? But that, that's the challenge. Yeah. I mean, essentially we're cave people. Uh, you reminded me of that. In, in Do I remind you that of a cave person? Yeah. And that I am too. And that, well, can, and let's take a step back and talk about, if you don't mind, for people who have never studied brain science before, uh, about how our, we really are cave people. Our brains have not gotten a server upload in how long and what do we need to know about the parts of the brain and, and how it connects to money. Yeah, I think it really does help to just understand that we are wired to do everything wrong. Like, you know, the fact that you've screwed up your financial life, that's not weird. Right. What's weird is there are people who haven't. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Like I, I saw a recent study, only 16% of us are like genetically wired to save. Oh, like, yeah, that's weird. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, it's like, why is that? Well, because in your tribe, 150 people, what, you're going to hoard this stuff to yourself. That's not going to last very long. People are going to look at you as being selfish. <clears throat> they're going to punish you. They're going to take it or they're going to kick you out. Yeah. And so, so we're sort of programmed like that. Um, and we just, we've done a lot of research as, as a field. Now we're just, we have all these biases, you know, we have this, this approach to life that helped us survive in that environment that trips us up all the time in our financial lives. Just the whole concept of saving, for example, it's like you couldn't save more than you could carry. Right. Um, Literally. Actually, actually like the spacing of childbirth is related to this too. It's like, you need to be able to have one child who can walk before you have another child you got to carry mm-hmm. um, because you're, you're a, you're a hunter gatherer, um, hunter gatherer band and you're moving around. Yeah. Um, you can only carry what you, you can only save what you could carry. You couldn't save food. It would spoil so we're wired to eat it as much as we can, you know, and the fatter and the saltier, the sweeter, the better. It's like, no wonder we struggle with the diet in the modern world. So it's it, the same reason why we struggle with dieting in the modern world is why we struggle, struggle with money. It's our, it's our ancient wiring. Fascinating. Oh my gosh. Okay. So as you mentioned, a lot of people confuse happiness with material things. Can you share your thoughts about true happiness and help us understand what happens to the brain when we're shopping? Yeah. So man, you know, shopping is an interesting thing. And um, again, I think this comes back to the hunter gatherer. It's like, you know, are are you a hunter? Are you a gatherer? Like, which one do you like to do? You know, you might like to do both. Um, It's really exciting to to get over there and see some stuff to get. Right. Um, So I think that's already built right into us. Like, ooh, get some stuff. This is shiny and new. Um, This is sweet and and, uh, tasty. So I think we're, we're just sort of built to do that. So we have to, we have to like override that impulse. It's not weird. You have that impulse and what's become so much harder is like, look, you can do it right now on your phone. You know, you can be sitting in the bathroom shopping. Like you don't even have to go to the store anymore. And so it's just become easier and easier to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the, the, the mindset I have is never trust your instincts when it comes to money which is counterintuitive to a lot of things that I, you know, we talk about as psychologists, like trust your instincts. You know, it's like when it comes to money, don't, don't trust your instincts at all. Um, Always be second guessing yourself because on the brain level, what happens is when we become emotionally flooded. So you get all excited um, or you get all scared. Stocks are going up, crypto's going down. It doesn't matter. Like that emotion essentially like floods your, we call it flooding, (laughs) floods your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that's human that tells you uh, don't do that. You know, these are the consequences (laughs) <laughs> this might not work out well, that part shuts off. And then we're very inclined to, to take an action. And it takes about 30 minutes or longer to calm down our emotional brain. That's when this part of your brain comes back online and you go, oh, I can't believe I, I right. said that. I can't believe I did that. And so that, that's one of the tips is to try to put some time between that impulse and action day yeah. if you can. You know, put it in your little online shopping cart. Don't buy it till tomorrow. Right. I think you'll be surprised. You might be like 75% of the stuff you put in there you didn't buy. That's true. I've, I've heard and seen those results um, in, in clients' lives. And I always say that one of the most powerful tools in personal finance is pausing. Yeah. And it, you're right. It's, it is so hard to do with stores that never close now. I mean, that's even, that's changed from, oh, shoot, that store isn't open on weekends in our lifetime. 
Not only that, but we're, we're organized now too. It's like, wait, did you, what did you, did you just look at something? What is that? Oh, you looked at um, some blinds, right? you know, and now all of a sudden you're opening websites and it's like, Hey, check out the blinds here. Check out these blinds. You know, all the cool kids have these blinds for their house. So, so actually the targeting on the ads too, is just capitalizing on that emotional brain. So, I mean, there are teams of scientists out there right now figuring out how to separate you from your money. How's, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, the social media documentary, ah, blanking on the name, um, that's out right now. Is it called social, the social, the social dilemma? Yeah. Um, is, is exactly about that. And, and a powerful watch. You kind of have to force yourself to watch it because we're all guilty and all pray to it. And I mean, I know, you know, moments of feeling kind of addicted. I can't, why can't I stop scrolling? What am I doing? You know, I'm I literally actually, avoiding that meeting. So we'll, we'll have some like self, this is where I need to work on myself a little bit. Cause I have a feeling I'm not going to want to be on my phone as much. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, you haven't watched it yet. Okay. That's, that's my offering to you today. I actually got a smaller screen on my phone, like a mini on uh, for the iPhone because it's really small. And I don't, I, it worked. I don't spend as much time on it because it's not as pleasurable. Like the huge ones that are too big for my small hands, um, <laughs> the iPad in your pocket kind of thing. Yeah. I was spending much more time anyway. Uh, I'm, I was trying to widen, widen the, the space of time between buying and um, browsing and, and, and enjoying the experience. So I have the, I'm the weird type of person where I hate shopping and I hate actually buying things. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so I, I think that could be too, um, probably some scarcity mindset stuff. Like it's not great. I mean, like, so first of all, it, it's really good if you want to become wealthy, but, um, you know, my wife, you know, then, then you get money scripts of somebody else, right? <laughs> right. you know, in a relationship. And, um, you know, when I met my wife, like I just told you, I had lawn chairs in there. It's sort of amazing that she found me attractive. <laughs> um, and you know, it's like, so for me, it was balancing out in the other way. It's like, Hey, guess what? You know, um, I didn't buy my first couch until I was almost 40. How's that? Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, and this is the part, this has been part of my evolution and learning too, is like, don't forget the other half, you know, it's the other half is to try to enjoy your life now, you know, and, and get some benefit and, and, and some experiences now and not delay gratification forever. Cause right. I'm sort of wired in that direction, probably because of that, um, my upbringing. Yes. Couches are comfortable. I, I got to hand it to my wife. They are. They really are. And they're good for cozying up with your two cute kids. Um, <laughs> so we have to shop, right? I mean, we have to procure food. Very few of us, though they do exist, are living off the food we grow in our backyards. Um, and so what are your best tips for conscious spending? You know, in addition to pausing, which at some point, if you pause too long, you'll starve, right? So you have to get food. Um, tell me about that. Yeah. So Carrie, and I know you're a huge proponent of this. Um, it works incredibly well when it comes to diets. I'll just use that as an example. So um, we, we have some incredible technology right now where you can just plug in what you ate. And, you know, and if you have a discipline of even for a week that everything you stick in your mouth, you're going to write down. Right. Um, what happens is this natural thing where it's like, you realize how much you're spending unconsciously or how much you're eating unconsciously. Yeah. Um, and just, <clears throat> just bringing it to consciousness. I have found in my own life when it comes to spending too, and my wife and I did this in the middle of COVID and she's like, you know, let's just, for me, it's the slippery soap is business expenses. Cause I, I had that separated off into a separate bucket in my head where that doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> um, and so we just took a hard look at that. And it was just, just that awareness was like, whoa, I mean, we, we cut expenses by 30% and I didn't even notice it because of right. consciousness. Wow. Yeah. And, and what you're talking about, just, um, just to be super clear with people is tracking and having a system to look at your money and knowing where your money is going. And I, I always say that's level one of financial wellness is knowing where your money is going, then creating a plan and, for, you know, seeing the difference between what you thought would happen and what did happen. That's where you can really make profound changes in your life and, and widen the gap between income, take home pay and expenses. And yeah, the, the data gathering is so incredible. It's powerful in and of itself. Um, I, I do it every day on, on my social media numbers too. I just track the numbers oh, yeah. just as an example. And it's yeah. like, it's incredible because 
I attribute so much of my growth to it because it's like, oh, look, I, I haven't been doing like, for example, Twitter, I haven't had any new followers in six months. It's like, oh, I'm not tweeting. Right, right. <laughs> um, oh. and so it inspires you to take action. Yes. Okay, exactly. It really does. It really, and it, the thing with money is it's not going anywhere. It's something we have to face and embrace for the rest of our lives. And so we might as well get with the program, right? And and create a system and a relationship that, that works and can maybe even feel pleasurable and satisfying and, and try to um, leverage endorphins and happy feelings in our brains from taking excellent care of this area of our lives. So, and, and I'll say this too, like, I feel like a couple um, mindsets that have been really helpful for me re regarding money and happiness is um, I, I have a, a shirt that I made and I, sometimes I use it, it says experiences greater than stuff. Mm -hmm. experiences greater than stuff. And I feel like to me, that's the mantra. Like I want to spend money on experiences um, because for me, stuff, I don't really like stuff to be honest, you know, well, first of all, I know that the endorphin rush leaves and then it's like, then you have the stuff. Yeah. Um, so it feels really great to buy it, um, but it quickly wears off. And you just think back to, you know, the holidays or your birthday as a kid, it's like the shiny toy. Right. Um, I see it happen with my kids all the time. It's like, oh, it's this thing. It's the most incredible. And then three days later, they sort of forgotten it. And that's what happens around stuff. Right. So I, I try to, to put my money and efforts towards experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that requires stuff. There's stuff involved with it. But um, to me, that that's ultimately where happiness around money comes from for me. Uh -huh. I, aside too, by aside First of all, let's not negate the level of like, I'm not stressed every day about paying my bills. I mean, yeah. money is hugely beneficial to get above that basic right. stress level. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, how can you help us understand the nature of credit cards from the brain science view? Yeah. So credit cards are um, an ingenious development yeah. by... Um, people who want to make more money off of you. you know? Right. That's it. It's just the money maker. I mean, it's, it's really what it is. Yeah. Um, I just did an interview for somebody doing a story on the airlines and they're like, Hey, the airlines came up with this great idea. Buy the, buy the trip now, pay for it later. And it's this big innovative thing. I'm like, okay, all right. We, we've seen this one before. And do you think it'll work? Oh, I think it'll definitely work. You know, um, buy it, give it to me now, no pain till later. Wow. And, and the problem with credit cards really, and, and by the way, I have a wallet full of them. I mean, we, it's hard to like navigate life without a credit card, right. um, but it makes spending less conscious. So I'm guilty of this all the time. Like I go to the grocery store, I'm going to buy stuff that I need. I literally will leave and, and I'll have this awareness. I have no idea how much money I just spent. And the reason I don't know yeah. is because I stuck a card in there yeah. and I hit a yes and I signed it. Um, and if you're, if you're slapping down hundred dollar bills, yeah. it's like this visceral, like, oof you know, and, and they know that. So they want to distance you from that experience. And so a <clears throat> great little tip, if you have a slippery slope category, like gifts, whatever, try to use cash. I know it's not very convenient, right. but it'll really wake you up. Yes. That, that I was given that assignment by a financial therapist early on in my journey. She was like, you know, because I had a lot of complaints about my financial life and the things that I wanted and you know, why isn't my family giving me more money? And why can't I earn more as a teacher? And um, why does everything I want cost, cost so much? A lot of complaints. And she said, well, the first thing I would like you to do is go on a cash only diet for the next 30 days. And I just about fell out of my seat, but I was paying her good money. So it was worth it to take her advice as painful as that pill was to swallow. And I did it. And I, it was, it was, it was humiliating <laughs> in a way. I mean, but, but let's just change that word today to humbling, you know, like walking from the gas tank fill up spot all the way into the store to pay and then have to go back to get the change or, you know, to put my $20 down or whatever was a really good exercise for me. Very healthy, very uncomfortable, kind of like um, drinking a wheatgrass shot. I mean, it was just awful. And I tell my clients that story when, when appropriate, because um, I'm like, I'm not assigning that to you, but here are some other ways to, you know, bring back control into this situation. <laughs> and um, 
never, never with laughing, but you know what I mean. Uh, and so is there such a thing as healthy credit card use or not? I, I think so. Um, I think it's, you know, when you're paying off your, your amount every month, yeah. anything, anything that's not that is unhealthy in my opinion. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because, Probably. because the interest rate, I mean, you're taking a loan from a bank to buy, to do what exactly, you know, what did you do with that loan you took from the bank? I mean, just, you got to think it through. <laughs> yeah. You got to think it through. <laughs> you went shopping for that loan. Is that really, you, you took out a bank from a loan and you're paying 17% APR or more because you wanted a pair of shoes. Like that's, that's where it starts to slip into. This is not good. It's not the best move for you. It's not, it's not healthy. It's really not designed for our benefit or, or financial wellness. And, and the, the way it distorts time by six weeks, it gets very wah, 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 you know? And so, um, yeah, that, that's a big, a big thing that almost none of my clients know some of these pieces of distinction around the nature of credit cards when they start with me, no matter how many degrees or businesses they run and tech full-time tech employees, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, so so help us understand one more thing about this. It's a psychological term or definition. What is this thing called locus of control? Yeah, so locus of control, and, and we've done a lot of studies on this. So when I say we, I mean psychology as a field. And then we as in me and my colleagues related to money. So mm -hmm. we've done a lot of studies on this locus of control thing. Because again, this goes back to me as a kid trying to figure out like, hey, so what? So what separates the wealthy from middle class, lower class, and locus of control is one of them. So essentially, there's two types. There's an internal locus of control and an external locus of control. And so locus is essentially means location. So when you think about the outcomes in your life, what's in control of those? Is it something external to you? Is it the world? Is it your parents? Is it, you know, whatever's outside of you? Or is it inside of you? Are you the one who's responsible for the outcomes in your life? And this is a profound question. And it's something you should be asking yourself all the time. I gave you a little hint what my locus of control was, because when I lost my money day trading, um, there's probably a lot of people to blame for that, right? Yeah. Um, but I said, why would a reasonably intelligent person do something so stupid like me? Like, I probably could blame my friend, my mentors who were, who were doing this thing. I could have blamed, you know, I don't know, the tech, tech people. I have no idea. There's probably, I'm so bad at external locus of control, I, I have trouble coming up with people to blame. But, yeah. <laughs> but the, the idea is if you can blame yourself for everything in your life. And, and when I say blame, people will sometimes get triggered by that because I want you to do it in a loving way, like a jokingly loving way. You're reasonably intelligent. So why would you do something so stupid? Yeah. You, you won't know, like this is the question you have to ask yourself. To take responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. That's a better way of saying it. Taking okay. responsibility. Um, and not only that, but like vigorously hunting for your culpability. Like it's a hobby for me. Like I get excited about it. So when I, when I'm running into a, a situation with my wife, like, oh my gosh, it's very clearly that she's irritating me and she's doing this and that wrong. I, I start to try, I try to shift into like a hungry search for what am I doing? Because it's so empowering. Like if I can, if I can discover that this result in my life is because of me, right? it is so incredibly empowering because now I, I there's something I need to learn. There's something I can do. I now have the power to change my life. And I like feeling powerful yeah. when it comes to the outcomes in my life. So I prefer to feel powerful. And by the way, studies have been done on this and it doesn't matter. When I say it doesn't matter, they control for things like gender, race, um, education, economic status, and internal locus control is associated with success in every area of life. So for example, people bounce back faster from losing a job when yeah. they look at, okay, what can I, what did I do to get fired? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what can I have done better? What can I learn from this? Um, and so that's what we found with ultra wealthy people. They are much more likely to look internally, take responsibility, try to readjust so they can be on their way. It's not about not making mistakes. One of the other things we found is like ultra wealthy people have had three major financial catastrophes in their life. Whereas middle-class people, one or less than one. I see. And so it's not about not making mistakes. It's, it's actually you know, maybe you should have two more financial catastrophes if you really want to become successful, because if you have the right mindset, you're going to mine that catastrophe to, to, to just get, get, take yourself to the next level. Yes. I, I, I could agree with that. I'm thinking about how many catastrophes I've had. I've, I've had a few. I mean, there was the pyramid scheme and there was the deeply dysfunctionally, um, financially amassed, amassed relationship. Um, and 
<laughs> I had to crawl my way out of these situations that I had bought completely into and drank the Kool-Aid and went all the way. And I learned a lot as well as setting up an S corp um, when I had no business doing that, not earning nearly enough money for that to be a smart thing to do, taking bad advice from, you know, an advisor. So, okay. All right. That's affirming. And by the way, Brad, so inspiring that you are that hungry and committed to taking such a level of responsibility in your marriage and your profession. And now it's tough because it's kind of seductive. It's kind of seductive for me to lay the blame on people who clearly aren't perfect, yeah. you know, um, and it, it's, it's, at, it, the problem is it's, it's really seductive I know. and it feels good. Yeah. And I feel better about myself sometimes. So it's the easy route to like immediate gratification, but yeah. it's also like sentences me to feeling powerless in my marriage. It's like, yeah. Um, and more separation because absolutely. If, you're, if absolutely. you're right. And if you're like, Oh, you know, gathering the evidence about all the ways that are on the disappointment or the whatever, then you're, then you're there. You are where you are. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and my wife's like, yes, yes, it is your fault. Look deeper. <laughs> well, she's a psychologist too, right? <laughs> she is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Our poor children. We've already started the therapy fund. <laughs> That's classic. Okay. Um, so you're also the pioneer of a theory called money disorders. And in the field of financial psychology, can you give us an overview of what these are and what ones you might see most often in your practice? So money disorders, I, I look at it as sort of chronic patterns of self-defeating behaviors. It's like, you know better, but you can't do better. You know, and maybe you've even promised yourself you would do better. Yeah. So let's say that you're not just an over shopper, but you're like compulsively over shopping. Yeah. So where, where shopping becomes an addiction, which is a full-fledged addiction, by the way. And it's like, what's interesting is the same number of people that right now today in the United States are experiencing a major depressive episode have a compulsive buying disorder. So this is very, very prevalent, um, significantly more prevalent in women too. <clears throat> Gambling, it's, it's more likely to, to be exhibited in males, um, which, which is a real similar disorder too. And both of these, you're just so obsessed with the activity. It gives you endorphin rushes. It, yeah. Quite often it's meant to like cover up some trauma or hole in your life. And it becomes a behavior that we're using to try to change ourselves chemically. Mm -hmm. um, and those kind of disorders can be extremely dysfunctional, harmful, and you know, require treatment, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, I will say this though, I think that the average uh, um, American, you know, has a money disorder <laughs> in the sense that we're overspenders. Yeah. You know, we have, well, I don't know what it is now, 6,000, 3,000 credit card debt, the average credit card holder. I mean, it's like, we're, we're not in great shape. Right. Um, so I think this is something that's pretty ubiquitous, but when it becomes so challenging in your life that it's interrupting your work, your relational experience, yeah. relationships. Yeah. The other one that I see, and, and I bet you see this too, is financial enabling where people are hurting themselves financially to try to help somebody else. And I use help in quotes because quite often it's not helpful. Quite yeah. often they're, they might even be supporting somebody with a money disorder right? who's in trouble. So that's the other thing to be aware of. Like when does financial help actually hurt people mm -hmm. uh, is another thing that I commonly see. Yeah, that, that's a huge one. And um, these days, especially with parents with adult children, who are remaining dependent much longer than the old days. And even in our generation, it was pretty much like, okay, here's, <laughs> I was sent to college with a checkbook. No one, I don't, I don't remember. It could have happened, but I should ask my dad. I should interview him. Did you teach me how to use the checkbook when you handed it to me? Or was it just a physical passing of paper? <laughs> and, um, you know, some, I, and this I acknowledge can be a lot to some people, but like $50 a month for spending money. Otherwise it's cafeteria, which they were also paying for. Um, but that didn't go very far. I mean, I had to have jobs at college and work in the summer teaching tennis, which was the skill set I had that would pay me the most money at the age I was. So I did that every summer, which was amazing. Um, and, and because I got to travel and live in all these beautiful, interesting places on the East coast. And um, but my point is, uh, not all my siblings turned out this way. You know, even in my tribe, um, with with 
I, I guess, hustling or taking that level of responsibility. And yeah, still today in my family, there, there are people who um, I don't worry about them and I'm not in a financial relationship with them, but it's, it's sad and painful to, to see people struggle and, and to remain, you know, well beyond their forties, fifties as adult children in, in the patterns of uh, dependence and entitlements and, um, and enmeshment. And it's caused enormous amounts of pain. So I've, I've seen it really, really up close and, but there, yeah, yeah. And, and the cutting people off is so hard, you know, know, because it's like, um, they're going to fall and they're going to, it's going to be painful and it's going to hurt. And, yeah, yeah. um, if you've been supporting them, they're going to hold you responsible for it and they're going to yeah. blame you for it. And it's, it can be a real trap. And, and on the dependency side too, it's, it's, uh, really, really crippling for your creativity, your motivation, your sense of self-esteem, your sense of agency. And it, it, I don't think there's any mistake. It's, it's probably not no mistake that so many of the wealthiest people in our country were ones that had to climb themselves up and think about all the stuff they had to learn and all the, you yeah. know, reinforce what behaviors are being reinforced by money. That that's the question I always want exactly. to be thinking about myself as a parent, you know? So I'm, I, again, I'm talking to myself right now, as I say this, like money is a powerful reinforcer. So what, you know, whatever reinforcers increase behaviors. So whatever you get, money for doing the behavior that preceded the money, that behavior is going to increase. And if, if you're getting money for doing nothing, you're going to increase doing nothing. It's just, it's plain human nature. Yeah. If you're getting money from hard work, it's going to increase hard work. That's true. Yeah. And, and thinking about how expensive those lessons were, you know, um, with, from my moments in, in my adult life of financial destruction or, you know, when, when it all burned down and Phoenix rising and, you know, I recovered and, and, and am all the stronger for it, but yes, very, very painful lessons. I don't want to go back there again. You know, I, and I've made major changes in my life to not repeat some of, some of those lessons that I did learn and recover from along the way. So, uh, not easy, but, <laughs> um, okay. And I, let me see, I'm looking at my questions. What else do I want to talk about in our last few minutes? You know, I love the way you describe financial freedom because I'm gathering from some of the images you've shared on social media. Do you walk to your office or can you tell me about um, what, how do you define wealth and financial freedom? Yeah. So for me, wealth equals owning your time. Like this is just for me personally, like, yeah. Um, wealth to me is not owning uh, a Sprinter van, although I kind of want one, Carrie, to be honest. And, and part of it is because everyone around me has one. Yeah. Um, and I have a tribal brain. Um, but, but so there's things I want, of course, but what I want more than anything is, is to own my time. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that um, I aspire to. I've, I've been pretty successful at, at moving in that direction. For much of my, you know, um, I think I own like 90% of my time or my children do. Um, and it's, it's like, to me, that's what it is because if you, it's your most precious resource. If you're, if you're, is it freedom? Is it financial freedom? I mean, are you wealthy if you're stuck at a job and you have to make payments and you're stressed out about these payments, but you drive a Mercedes or a Lamborghini, or you have a multi-million dollar house. I mean, it's, a, it, everyone has to define this for themselves, but for me, financial freedom is, that I can actually be sick for a week. Right. I can take a month off and it's, I don't have to stress about paying my, my mortgage, paying for my life. Right. So that's really what it is for me. It's, it's low stress and it's um, feeling like I can do wh what I want, when I want, with who I want. Um, and there's a dark, there's a downside to that too, because when you have freedom, freedom can be dangerous because people have a tendency to get existentially depressed in the midst of it. Um, which, which is a big irony and something that um, people have a hard time really grasping. But there's been tons of studies, by the way, on this, like tons of studies. Like this isn't even debatable anymore. People are most depressed on, on vacations and in their free time and on the weekends than they are at work. Yeah. Um, so it, it's something you have to uh, be conscious of because it's not like that money and that freedom is automatically going to make you happier. It's just statistically speaking, it might make you less happy. Um, so, so anyway. I know. <laughs> <laughs> to be human and to have these. But I do. I, I, I've, I'm, I'm super blessed to be living in Boulder, Colorado. I, I, I'm working in my office right now. I, I could work from home. I have young kids that sometimes get loud, 
um, and I want to be able to talk to you right now. Right. Um, but I do, I, I get to either walk or ride my bike to work every day. We're, we're trying to live on just one car as long as we can, oh, wow. which I like to do. I feel yeah. somewhat superior to all of you all out there who um, have more cars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so so I'm, try I'm enjoying that life and I, I want to live it as long as I can. Amazing. How beautiful. Um, so I have one question from someone who wrote in, which is, it, this is in quotes, how can I be truly happy with abundance, given that there are so many without? I know the stock answers, but still experience a lot of guilt and resistance to having sometimes. All right. So that, that is such a beautiful human being who asked that question. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, it is. It is. This is not something that you need to eradicate and stomp out. And you don't need to create an avatar of people who don't have as much as being lazy and blah, blah. You don't need to do any of that. And, and you shouldn't do any of that um, because it's not the truth. You know, there, there are many people working way harder than we are here in the United States who are, who are suffering and they're, they're smarter than you. They're more hardworking than you. <laughs> um, none of this is what you deserve in that sense. You know, some of it's so much of it is luck, just to be honest, like, um, you know, and, and it's your comparison group. So if you are in the United States right now, I don't care how much money you have. I, I, I really don't care. You are in the richest 1% of human beings who've ever walked the face of this earth. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, by far, by far. And so I think we should all feel a little bit responsible for that and have a little bit of sense of guilt around that in terms of this unearned privilege of yours by being born here today in the United States. It's already so unfair. And so life is not fair. And I, I feel like that, that need to want to take care and give back is something that should be built into your financial plan. Yeah. And from, is, from my point of view, if you're making $30,000 a year, and let's say that you're giving five or 10%, you know, away, it's like, well, that's great, but wouldn't it be better if you made a hundred and given five or 10% away? Or how about a million? Right. Or how about 500 million? Yeah. Like, I, so have a plan to take care of that deep, beautiful human need to try to take care of other people. And I want, I, it's people who ask that question who I want to be the wealthiest people on earth, plain and simple. Yeah, it's a good friend of mine. Um, so I'll make sure that he hears that response. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, so last question, will you tell us about your latest book, Money Mammoth, and what inspired you to write it? Well, I wasn't anticipating you asking me about this. Oh, I happen to have it on my desk Hi. here. Yeah. Um, but Money Mammoth is, is my latest book. And really what, what we did in that book is I, I like the, I, you know, we talked about the cave person brain. Yeah. And so um, we use the mammoth as, as sort of a metaphor for that emotional part of your brain. And that's driving all your decisions. And then we talk a lot about cave people and, and our development with that tribal mentality and how it plays out in your life. So the mammoth is a metaphor. The book is really focused on <clears throat> how to use and sort of harness the power of financial psychology. So we've been talking about overriding our impulses. Well, how can we harness some of those impulses? Yeah. That's where it gets really fun and exciting and just point that towards our goals because it becomes unstoppable. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll just give you a quick hint. The clearer you can get with your goal, the more pictures you can have, the more emotionally involved you can get with it, the more powerful it will be. And one study we did that we talk about in the book, we went, go into in great detail. We had people increase their savings rates by 73% after one hour of closing their eyes and visualizing their goals and their values and what it is they want. All of a sudden they went from saving 10% of their income to 17% just doing that. And wow. it, we didn't, it wasn't any spreadsheets. It wasn't any uh, formulas around how much you should be saving. They just got so pumped up about what this money could be used in service for in their lives and for their family and their goals and values, they just became unstoppable. So that, that's essentially what we're, that book is about. That's great. Awesome. I'm enjoying it. I'm halfway through. I, I love my autographed copy by you and your dad. So it's really warmed my heart to see the notes in, in the beginning. Thank you for that. Um, so now that you're done with that book, what else are you working on in your business? What's up and how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing, you know, I have a lot of things that I, that I like to do. I'm working on another book Aaron, just to give you a seventh one to read. Um, <laughs> um, and so I'm doing that and I, but I've been putting a lot of time into my social media. So I, I do a lot of content creation and um, without any really sort of strategic business goal, to be honest, but it's, it's like this part of that I have in me that I, I'm so, so passionate about training younger people and giving them the mindset. And so I do a lot of stuff on TikTok. 
So I, I pump out three videos a day on TikTok and I cross promote those on their platforms. And, and the reason I do it is I, I got a text the other day <clears throat> or a DM on, on there and said, somebody said, Hey, I've been following you on TikTok for about a year and a half. I just wanted you to know that I, I got out of college and I got my first job and I'm saving and investing 30% of my income. And I never would have done it if I hadn't seen your TikToks. And I'm like, okay, so I have just set up this 21 year old, just slam dunk multimillionaire. Yeah. I don't, I don't even, I don't even get to ask what job they have. You can work at McDonald's and if you're doing that, you'd be a multimillionaire. So I just get so passionate about that. And, and, and um, I, I find social media, especially TikTok as a place to go for that young mindset yeah. because I feel like they're so malleable. And if, if the right information comes at the right time, it can be transformational. Wow. So I'm, it's doc, at Dr. Brad Klontz on, on all social media. So I've, I've just been pretty pumped up about doing that and having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Dr. 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 Brad Klontz. Yes. I, I follow you. It's fun. It, it's fun. You're, you're silly and funny, but also educational. And I can see your passion and all the work you're doing. Congratulations on everything. Thank you. Yeah. And thank, thank you. you thank you for your time and being here today. That was really fun. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And Always good to see you. Great to see you. And with that, we're out of time. Thank you again for tuning in and please acknowledge yourself for taking the time to learn, practice, connect, and receive support. Again, I'm Carrie Friedberg, the SF Money Coach. You can contact me and find information about my coaching practice, online course, or financial literacy membership site at SF, as in San Francisco, moneycoach.com. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me at Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E at sfmoneycoach.com. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. And with that, we're out of time. Thank you again for tuning in and please acknowledge yourself for taking the time to learn, practice, connect, and receive support around money. I am Carrie Friedberg, the SF Money Coach. You can contact me and find information about my coaching practice, online course and financial literacy membership site at sf as in san francisco sfmoneycoach.com please reach out if you have any questions or comments i'd love to hear from you we'll talk soon